hi and welcome to the Near and Queer to My Heart podcast. I'm your host, Amanda G. Always happy and thankful to be here, have y'all here with us. Happy Pride Month. Hope you're having a good one. We had our Pride Weekend in New Orleans last week. It was amazing. I'm about to head to New York for their Pride Weekend. Very excited about that and very excited to bring you this episode. This is a guy that I met through work and I was just like, you would be great on stage. And so he's done our Greetings from Queer Mountain show now three times, and every single time he's gotten such amazing feedback because he's so funny and so witty and just so lovely. And I was like, I'd like to get to know you better. I'm going to have you on the podcast. So he said absolutely, and I'm so excited to bring you this episode. So please welcome Dylan Perry. Hey, Dylan, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I think it's funny. I, I asked uh, the last guest I asked, I think I, I said, how are you doing? And they said, well, and I'm like, is that is that like, is it proper podcast etiquette to do that? Because when I'm at the bar, I'm not like, well, but a lot of people on the podcast do that. So maybe we're bringing yeah. some class to the joint. It was all podcast pretension. <laughs> I've actually never said well in response to how you doing. <laughs> in my entire life before this very moment right here. So <laughs> I'm with you. I would never say it just doesn't make it doesn't sound right because it sounds to me it sounds like you're correcting me when you say well when I say how are you doing? It's like it comes off very English teacher. Yeah. So, yeah no, it comes off I, like that is the proper thing to say, but like next time you're at a bar say it. See what some just see what someone does. I won't. I simply won't. <laughs> like, no, I understand no. the difference between adjectives and adverbs. I just refuse to participate. Yeah. For a while, I was doing this thing where if I asked someone how they were and then they said good, I would try to one up them and they'd be like, how are you? And I would be like, so fantastic because they had just said good. And then I would or like I'd be like, great. Or if they're like, oh, I'm not doing that well. I'd be like, I'm doing very not well. Like <laughs> I was just yes and them. And I really confused people. Um, and it was amusing to me, but nobody else got joy out of it. The thing I hate the most is when you say, how are you doing to someone? And it's usually like people who are at work or like, it's not, it's not your friends. And you say, Hey, how you doing? Like to a waiter or something. And they'll say, uh, live in the dream. And it's always so sarcastic. Mm-hmm. And I just can't stand it. Cause it's like, I get it. You don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Probably like we yeah. don't, we don't have to do this to each other. You <laughs> can just give me a simple, like good for nothing. And uh, it will cost you nothing. And we can just go about our lives. Yeah, I used to think like it was a cop out when people talk about the weather, but then I find myself doing it and I'm like, oh, this is why people do it because it fills the air and it is meaningless. Yeah, it is a great way to feel like things aren't going well. The more small talk we belabor. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, wow, we're, we're we like when I call my family members, I don't have anything in common with and we go from how you doing to the weather. And then I'm like, crap, I don't have anything. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing for my aunt <laughs> yeah. who I've known for like my entire life I just have nothing else to say so then you just start listing tv shows that you've heard of you know <laughs> well I can't do that because I don't watch uh, the only tv I watch is antiques roadshow and this like British game show called taskmaster that's it and no one else watches either of those things no I mean I've, I've watched antiques roadshow but I heard that lately the antiques have not been as antique as as I would want as I'm about to turn 40. So I'm not interested in in finding out that I myself am an antique at this point. See, I love antiques roadshow. I love but I love it for the crap. Like I want to see the things that are absolutely (laughs) hideous that no one should have in their home. But then they're still valued at like several thousand dollars. And or even better, I love when people come on and, and they find out that they're what they have is fake. That that's like the cherry on top for antique road show for me. <laughs> yeah, they're like my grandma got this from her grandma. Who got this from her grandma? Who brought it overseas? You know, right. it's, yeah, and the you boat got this sank from the home and, goods. <laughs> yeah, and the boat sank, and it's the only thing that was survived was my grandma and this thing and this trinket. <laughs> and they're like, it is worth negative dollars. Like it actually will cost you money to dispose of it. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that's that's a good stuff. Yeah. I mean, anyone anyone can write compelling drama for um, you know a, a cable TV, but I mean, it takes real um, 
to me, real tragedy comes from antiques furniture. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they say, uh, you know, sometimes it's just the truth that <laughs> it's the real stuff that gets you. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's get into it. Let's get into your life. I, I actually. I know a little bit about your life. So I know you've done our Greetings from Queer Mountain Storytelling show. Um, and you and I actually uh, worked in the same office at one point, but it was also during COVID. So we kind of worked together. I do remember, though, the first time, because we wear masks in the office. And I remember the first time you took your mask off and you had a mustache. And I wasn't ready for that because <laughs> um, I didn't know. I didn't picture that. You know how, like, you picture the rest of somebody's face? Right. Um, or, like, when you read a book, you, like, picture a character. And then when you see the movie, you're like, that's not right. Um <laughs> <laughs> like I had pictured you clean cut uh, and then you had this mustache, which is beautiful, but I just, Thank I just you. wasn't ready. I was surprised. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I love my mustache. I came to it recently. Like it's really funny because when I was in the Navy, I didn't have my mustache most of the time. I think I grew it out a couple of times, but then I like got out of the Navy to go to law school and over the summer, basically, I grew my mustache out so that everyone who met me in law school, like, knows me with this mustache. But, like, most of the people who've known me the rest of my life mm-hmm. don't. So it was really funny, like, having, like, mixing social circles where, like, some people are like, look at Dylan's ridiculous new mustache. And other people are like, that's a core component to his entire identity. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I uh, I think I, I stole it from my dad. I think he had... Um, the best reaction to my mustache was because he had the exact same mustache and uh, I wore it to visit him one time. And he said, what the fuck is that on your face? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that would be what my parents would respond with. Yeah. So where, where are you from originally? So I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia, but my mom was in the Navy. So I moved around a lot, which was really funny. I was just listening to Jade's episode uh, just before uh, we got on. And I was like, oh, no, another military brat. Like, <laughs> this is going to be entirely unusable for Amanda. I mean, it's, you're going to have a different experience than than uh, Jade did. But it's it's also interesting. I am always fascinated by, like, queerness and religion and that kind of overlap. And then I'm also uh, always fascinated by, by queerness and, and the military and how those interact and overlap. And how, you know, especially, I don't know if things are better now, the allegedly you know some policies have changed but i don't know if that's the truth or whatnot but like growing up with that and then you also decided to go into the military yourself which which jade didn't you know jade always knew uh he was more meant for the the stage (laughs) and he went to broadway and and went that track much we both perform yeah (laughs) (laughs) but just so your mom was in the military what was that like having a a mom and was that like what was that experience like i guess like it's kind of a cop out, but I don't know what else it could be. Like I guess I just it was seemed very natural to me. Like my mom always had a very like a, authoritarian's the wrong word. My mom had a very like commanding presence, and like she like is like she gets shit handled, and so it just seemed natural. Like, but it was very fun. I used to call in sick to school, or well, no, I would go to school. And then like an hour into school, I would be bored and I would call my mom and pretend to be sick. So she'd come get me so that I could go to the base that she was on. My mom was an air traffic controller. So like I would go with her into the tower, like at these military bases and like get to see all these cool like military jets taking off and landing. And so, yeah, it was really, it was really fun. I think moving around a lot as a kid helped me like broaden my perspectives and be very be a very understanding and inclusive person of people from different backgrounds because when you grow up living on a military base a lot of times all the kids on that base with you are also from all over the country like everyone is a total mix so i was just very used to being around like diverse groups of people and diverse perspectives and so i really valued that a lot yeah but how how was it like being the, I don't know, like when I was growing up, you know, and they show this like all these in TV shows that you don't watch, but um, I also <laughs> definitely saw it happen. I grew up in the same place. I went to the same elementary school, junior high, high school with like everyone in my neighborhood, you know, was in the same house from when I was three till when I left for college. Like, but um, I know when like a new kid comes to town, like they, sometimes they had a rough time. And I didn't understand that. Like, who cares if like this person didn't go to elementary school with us and they're here now? 
but I, you know, I, one of my best friends from high school came, um, she was a military brat and she came in junior year of high school and she was like, so thankful that I would like hang out with her. And I was just like, but you're cool and fun. Like, I don't care that you were somewhere else until now, but did you have that experience or was it like everywhere you went was, you know, a musical or was it kind of a mixed bag? (laughs) So the place I went to that was a musical, weirdly enough, was Key West, which is already a pretty gay place even before I showed up. But I was a I was a little kid. I wasn't I was like when we were stationed in Key West, I think I was eight. And when we left, I was 13. But uh, all the kids on base were like like all the kids I hung out with were also all new like transplants or like, you know, coming and going. So no one had like the standing to say, like, this is our place. Like we were all like transient community so like it was really cool there so it wasn't like a west side story musical where it's like this is our turf (laughs) yeah no it it wasn't like that it was a little bit like that as far as like officers kids versus enlisted people's kids so like for listeners that don't know like you know if you join the military right out of high school typically you enlist and you're sort of like more of a worker bee uh, position in the military but then if you're have a college degree you might become an officer which is more like a leadership position and also a lot more money so that distinction stems from like hundreds of years ago where you know the officers were like the gentry and the enlisted people were like lower class people and so like because of that class distinction from way back then there's still a little bit of a class distinction I mean there's plenty of like modern day class distinctions as well but like there's some of that holdover where some of my like I would go out hang out with friends who were just other kids to me, but like my mom would talk about like their parents differently based on like what they did, which was just more, I mean, more funny to me than anything. Cause I was like, well, what the hell difference does that make? But when I left, so when I was in Key West, it was very suburban, like bunch of kids in my neighborhood. I could just go hang out with, like just go run and play outdoors. And my, because we lived on base, Like, I could really just go wherever and do whatever I want as long as I stayed on base. And my mom would, you know, holler for me at the end of the day. When we moved to Mississippi, we moved out into the boonies. And I, like, lived out in the woods. There were, like, no other kids around. And all the kids at my school weren't military brats. And that's where I experienced, like, what you're talking about with your friend. Where, like, I came in. I didn't speak with a Southern accent. I didn't take square dancing classes in elementary school. Um, I didn't go to Baptist church. And so I was like super foreign to all these other kids. Yeah. And that was, you were 13. So. Yeah. So that was like uh, middle school, like upper middle school. And then all the way through uh, graduating high school. Okay. So you stayed in Mississippi that whole time. Yeah. My mom retired. And so (laughs) she just was like, let's just go to Mississippi of all the places we've been throughout our colorful life together. (laughs) What really stuck was Meridian, Mississippi for some reason. So like to go back to your first question of where am I from? Like, depending on who's asking the simple answer, like would just be from Mississippi. But a lot of times, like my friends make fun of me because I'll, I'll switch it up. Like, where are you from Virginia or Mississippi or Back when I was in the Navy, I might just say wherever my last duty station was, like, I'm from Connecticut. I have no roots in Connecticut whatsoever. I was just stationed there one time. So it's fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, would, I would always say Key West. I don't know why you're dropping the ball on that. Yeah. That's such a cool place to be from. Yeah, you're right. I think that's, I think the reason I haven't been doing that is because I'm like low key traumatized from saying that when I moved to Mississippi as a kid and Mm. everyone being like, what is that? (laughs) Having to explain (laughs) it. So, but yeah, no, I think you're, you put me onto something. I think of all of my lineages, that's the one I need to start claiming more of, especially if I want any sort of gay bona fides. Oh yeah. That'll definitely bolster that over (laughs) Meridian, Mississippi. (laughs) Um, When you finished high school, is that when you joined the military or did you go to college for like, what was your, trajectory I went to college before I joined the Navy I majored in foreign language which I think I talked about on one of my queer mountain appearances and so I joined the Navy after college I was originally going to be a pilot but pilots in the Navy have to do a lot of swimming during their training and I can't swim very well (laughs) despite being in the Navy so um 
I was like, well, what else do you guys got? And so they uh, sent me to supply corps school, which is where you learn how to do budgeting for the military, like logistics, and then also food service. So on the ship that I worked on, I ran the galley. And so I was in charge of like all the meals that we ate, uh, ordering all the food, making sure all the cooks did a good job and cleaned everything right. So I don't know. Are you like a military family or was it just your mom that was in the military? So my grandpa was in the military, but everyone's grandpa was in the military. That was like... <laughs> no, it kind of had to be, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There wasn't like um, a big choice. But yeah, my uh, my dad was also in the Navy. That's how they met. He was in the Navy in like the wild 80s. And like he would tell just crazy shit stories about like sneaking weed onto the boat. Like he tested positive for drugs one time, but it was before like the digital era. So they printed his test results that showed he tested positive and they like sent him to his boss to go get yelled at. And on the way, he just tore out the page of the like <laughs> positive results and just threw it away. And then that was that was it. That was the end of his. Re- he suffered no repercussions. And he would brag about sneaking weed into like a Bible, uh, like when he was coming on board, and just all sorts of crazy shit. And my mom was not like that at all. She was super straight laced. And that's probably why she stayed in the Navy a lot longer than he did. <laughs> but um Yeah, everything went digital and your dad was like, I can't <laughs> Yeah, it's always funny, you know, talking about like having a military family, like when I talk to people who went into the military whose family is not military affiliated at all. And like how like it's even in recruiting commercials, like how do you talk to your parents about wanting to join? And it's like it's like me on the way out the door to my mom, like, hey, I'm gonna go join the Navy. All right, be home later. Like, it was very, there was no drama in it at all. So did you always know that the military was going to be your path? Or was it some some sort of expectation? Or was that a choice you came to on your own? Because for like, I guess for me, I did not grow up in a military family. Yes, both of my grandfathers served in World War Two. I don't know what they actually did there. But besides that, that's it. Like a military wasn't presented to me as, as an option. I didn't know a ton of, I had my one friend whose parents had been in the military, but I didn't, I wasn't around a lot of people that that was their life. So I'm just, in, you know, interested in like how you specifically for you, you know, said, I'm going to join the military. Yeah, I think so. It definitely wasn't like expected of me. Like, I don't think my parents would have, they wouldn't have made me or or tried or ever even like try to talk me into it like like a soft sell but I think it was very comfortable to me because I grew up around it and so it felt very you know I wasn't doing exactly like I wasn't being an air traffic controller like my parents were I wanted to be a pilot so it was like kind of different I guess I mean still very connected and what I ended up doing had nothing to do with what either of my parents did while I was in but I don't know it, it definitely was just something that I think appeal well I, I guess that thing I'm forgetting is that I uh, when I was going to college I signed up with the Navy like to pay for me to go to college so I mean the other besides it just being comfortable and familiar a lot of it was like that's how I was going to be able to go to undergrad otherwise um, I would not have been able to afford going to college so I guess it was um, Uncle Sam's briber- bribery taking the devil's <laughs> money as they say uh, that got me in. It's either that or you sign up for a bunch of student debt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can either, I feel like I served on the front end to get free school. And then, you know, some of our mutual acquaintances are like serving on the back end for like the uh, public sector or public interest loan forgiveness program or whatever. So it's like you could do one way or the other. And um, how, how long were you in the military for in the Navy? Six years. So I was on a submarine for two years, I think. And then three years, I was at um, a schoolhouse that trained foreign special forces. And that was a lot of fun, too. But um, yeah, I just did the two tours and then I got out to go to law school. That's an interesting uh, dynamic, uh, dichotomy. <laughs> but which, uh, going to law school in the military or? Leaving the military to go to law school. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, so I weirdly wanted to be a lawyer ever since I watched My Cousin Vinny as a little kid. Good movie. Yeah, when you're talking about like, 
like even when I was planning on going to the Navy as a pilot, I still kind of thought I would be an attorney one day. So like, that's probably my bigger common thread of professional purpose throughout life is (laughs) wanting to be Joe Pesci. Well, no, I wanted to be Joe Pesci, but with Marissa Tomei's wardrobe from that movie. Yeah, That was like the the fusion (laughs) that I wanted to, to create. Yeah, and I love her her attitude and her accent and, you know, the way she tells it like it is. I'm like, oh, man. There's so many good lines in that movie. Yeah, that movie's just, it's just so well done. And every, I watch it like once a year and I'm like, nope, still, still holds up. Oh, yeah. One of my uh, uh, best friends in the Navy was from Long Island and and he had never seen the movie before. And like, we were watching it one day together and like, Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei like make their initial appearance when they show up and it's like the whole culture shock like look at these New Yorkers and bumfuck Alabama and he's like he's like oh uh, not everyone up there talks like that <laughs> it's just like <laughs> like he's just objecting the whole time to like this stereotyping of New Yorkers and I was like hey man I don't know much about Long Island or New York really but I know a lot about bumfuck Alabama and they got it spot on in this movie. <laughs> like they did their homework. Like this is like they've dotted their eyes and crossed their T's on this. That is a correct portrayal. So I have to assume that if they did the research to get like middle of nowhere Alabama correct, they might know a thing or two about <laughs> what <laughs> you people sound like. So. Also, Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei, I feel like would not have signed up for that movie if it wasn't spot on. You know what I right. mean? Right. Yeah. I I have to believe that there was a good amount of ad-libbing i feel like in that script i just want to believe that i don't want to know the truth i just want to believe that it, to the maximum extent possible their script was hollow and they just improvised the whole thing i would love that i would love that like, just a blank script they're just like it, courtroom scene in a courtroom and then it's just <laughs> go. <laughs> i usually ask this with like um more with the religion side of things but um the question i want to ask is like and and maybe I don't know your religious beliefs, so maybe it ties into it. But usually it's like um, like growing up, since you did grow up with a military mother and father, was gay talked about? Was that a concept, a thing that you knew even existed? Or if you did, was it talked? Because I know there's a lot like throughout the history of the military, you know, there's don't ask, don't tell and a lot of, you know, other things before that and still after that, even though that's been officially repealed. I don't know if that's a, a, a fact or not, but I don't know if that's part of mil- And I'm asking because I don't, like I said, I don't know military culture. Is that part of like a, the, a culture or a thing you grew up with being aware of? And then I will ask about your time, you know, in the military, but I just kind of want to know that like framework for you. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's high time we talk about gay shit. Yeah. Let's <laughs> but get- no, we've been talking for a minute. Um, so... Yeah, so my mom is also uh, like very Catholic. And so it was like being gay was super not an option for me like it was for I think most gay people like around our generation where it's like this not quite as ostracizing as it was maybe 20 years ago or so. Like 20 years before when we were in our like coming out phase, as opposed to like nowadays where the more I talk to young people, the more it seems like less and less ostracizing to your family, like your innermost family. But I also like remember my mom would have, I think my mom had like a coworker that was gay and it was kind of just like a tongue in cheek or like, like danced around in front of me. And so, yeah, like, so when I came out to my mom, you know, the struggles I had with her with that centered from her religion, not really from her being in the military. Cause I think like my mom was like, at the end of the day, most people in the military are professionals who just work. And so like, even if like they find you morally repugnant, <laughs> they just kind of like get on with it. Cause it's not like, too many options um, other than just figuring out how to work with the people you get. You don't get to like choose your team. So yeah. So then it was really weird. I came out to my mom first because I think as a man, sometimes it's easier to try and come out to a woman than to a, another man. Cause it just seems like a lower threat. Like even though, I mean, it's your parents. So like, obviously there's no sexual dynamic there anyway, but like 
to just broadly speaking, me telling a woman I'm gay is me saying like, I'm just, if anything, I'm more similar to you. Assuming you're talking to a straight woman, obviously. Whereas like with a guy, then it's just like a weird, like the whole toxic masculinity thing gets involved. So it backfired spectacularly because my mom is like super religious and like did not take it well for a few months. How, how old were you at the time? Oh, I came out. So I came out to my mom when I was... 17 or 18 um I went to uh the last two years of high school I went to a boarding school so I was on like the fast track <laughs> of, <laughs> of gay male development Is it all boys uh it was so like it was a co-ed school but like a boys dorm and a girls dorm so okay yeah a bunch of 16 and 17 year old boys <laughs> locked up in a dorm like you do the math like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I figured a lot of shit out real quick so um so I came out like around 18 and then I didn't come up to so I didn't want to come out to my dad after that, like for a few years, but then my dad went through a really bad phase of life as far as like, uh, like he was abusing pain pills after like a surgery he had. And then like my parents got divorced. Like he, like it, it went from at first, I didn't want to tell my dad because I was nervous to, I didn't want to tell my dad because my dad had his own shit going on <laughs> for a few years. But then when I finally did come out to my dad, my dad was just like, duh. Like, it was so, like, blasé <laughs> and just did not care. I was like, what? Really? You you know? He's like, yeah, I, I've known. And I was like, H- how? And he's like, well, number one, you keep bringing all these girls over to the house, and you're not romantically involved with any of them. And then he was like, and even back when you were playing t-ball, you, you just to sit in the outfield and pick flowers instead of playing sports. And I was just like, it was t-ball, dad. No one's dinging any dongers, like, into outfield. Like, it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> one kid might get, like, a base run. What was I going to get, like, a pop fly out, out in outfield and t-ball? But uh, my dad, um, like, basically accepted me right away. And then, like, my mom came around and, you know, has met my partner and, like, accepted him, like, as much as I imagine she would have done you know, if I had been straight and brought a woman home, so. Oh, that's good. Um, That's progress. Yeah. So, and then, like, for going into the, I'll just assume what your your next question was going to be about, like, being in the military. Yep. Um, Yeah, like, I it was honestly one of my favorite things I did while I was in the military was, like, meet people who were super homophobic, like, out of, really out of just pure ignorance, not out of like malice, just genuinely like have never met gay people, has only seen what Fox News or, you know, like any any media really portrays gay people as. And then they like meet me and have to work with me and realize that like, wow, Dylan's gay and he eats lunch too. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> and just like not all much. these things. Yeah, yeah. That they would just like realize like, wow, it's like, it's like they're just people. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> Uh, a lot of like really funny interactions of guys just being like almost even genuinely like the putting the phobic and homophobic like genuinely scared as opposed to just hateful and um, me having to be like it's okay like (laughs) we're just working right now like it's fine like I've I do all the gay shit after I take the uniform off it's fine (laughs) (laughs) uniform on no gay shit (laughs) right yeah put it away (laughs) <laughs> I had one of my uh, favorite things was I caught two Hispanic sailors who worked for me, like talking to each other. And one of them called the other one, like the Spanish Esler, which I know, but I won't repeat here. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. um, uh, and I just turned to him and I was like, you think I don't know what the fuck that means? <laughs> and it really, it genuinely didn't bother me. Cause it's just like, whatever, how straight dudes talk to each other. Like, I wasn't being called that, so whatever. And I was just like, you think I don't know what the fuck that means? And like, got really mad, like just acting really mad at him. And he was like, I, this dude's whole life flashed before his eyes. Like, I know he was like so scared that he, like he was going to get written up and like have, you know, this like hateful shit in his record, like his disciplinary record. And um, so, that, so that's how I won hearts and minds. <laughs> <laughs> One threatening stare at a time. <laughs> right. I that, that thing is the only, the one time, I think the one like explicit time, because I, I would encounter like homophobia in like ways where it's like impossible to prove, you know, or like things where it's like you have to put like two and two together to realize like, oh, I didn't get that promotion 
because I'm not one of the boys, like in this regard or, or something like that. Like that kind of stuff that always had like an element of like unprovability. Oh yeah. No, as, as a woman, I, I understand. <laughs> sure. Right. It's yeah. like, no one's going to say it outright and I can't prove it, but there's a right. suspicion that this guy got this thing because he's a tall, straight white dude or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, whatever the situation is. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, it, it, that's hard because it is it is still like fucked up and it's still discriminatory, but it's hard to show it. Right. I had I was lucky to have one time where it was not <laughs> up for debate. I walked into an office and uh, this guy who is like and it's always the ones who are like just plain ass incompetent at their job who always seems to be like the ones who are also super homophobic. <laughs> but um, this dude was like such a dud, one of the most worthless members on the team. And I walked into a room and his back was to me when I walked in. He didn't see me. And he was like, yeah, you know, uh, nowadays they just have all these S-slurs and T-slurs working in the Navy. And, uh, you know, obviously he said those real words. And I, like, locked eyes with the guy he was talking to who now, like, sees me walk in (laughs) behind the dude who just said that shit. And uh, I, I didn't say anything. I just, like, walked back out of the office. And then later when the other, like the dude who said that shit left, I went back into that guy's office who like I locked eyes with. And I was like, hey, did he say that shit? I think he said. And this guy was like, again, like really scared, (laughs) like, "Uh, yeah. And I just want to say I had nothing like we were like that came out of nowhere. Like I have no idea what. I mean, it was kind of topical. It was right when Obama lifted the uh, ban on trans service. So like it was at least current is his homophobic <laughs> and transphobic commentary. He's like, yeah, man, like that's not me. Like that, I don't know what where that was coming from. I was like, okay, cool. And so I went and like reported him and like got that guy in trouble. And um, that was a time where like I was one of the more thick skinned people while I was serving, and it I took it kind of as I need to do some politic in here. Like I'm in a very non-gay not necessarily non-gay friendly but non-gay familiar and if all I do is like bow up every time someone says something that probably could have been you know either said smarter or not said at all like if all I do is pick every battle like I'm not gonna be a good ambassador (laughs) for our tribe so I I really rolled with a lot of punches but that was the one time that I was like no fuck you and it, honestly, I think it was because that guy sucked so bad. <laughs> it's like, yeah. he, like you were the worst one on this team. How dare you? Like, <laughs> like you? So when you were in the military, like, were you out or were you just standing up for other folks? Or um, and, and what was that during? When, when I don't remember when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was. Uh... So Don't Ask, Don't Tell got repealed in 2011. I'm pretty sure. It's either 2011 or 2012. Yeah, I was like, I know it was during Obama, so... Yeah, um, shame on me for not remembering. <laughs> yes, shame on you. <laughs> right, that's what, I remember. That's what I really... That's my gotcha journalism here. Right, Really yeah. wanted to get out of you, Dylan. <laughs> I remember I was watching the news when it was announced, or, or like, when it passed... It must not have passed. When... It must have been announced, because it was probably an executive order. I, there's no way it was legislative. But um, I was with my grandma, and we were watching the news, and she was telling me about how like my grandpa knew a gay guy in the army in world war ii and how like he like refused to associate with him because he was gay because my grandma didn't know i was gay at the time i never like really bothered coming out to like my grandparent generation because it's like whatever you know you're not gonna see me grow old into some spinster like you can <laughs> you can go to your grave thinking i just didn't meet the right lady yet that's fine and so yeah it was really awkward her being like yeah like telling me the story that i guess she's trying to make my grandpa sound great and I was like oh great <laughs> I was like grandpa would have hated me but um, yeah, it's like we're fighting for freedom but like who's freedom right exactly a very specific measured <laughs> Caucasian <laughs> cis hetero freedom freedom on um, their terms sure right. yeah, I, I don't get that it's like okay freedom here's this guy who feels free enough to be out in World War II which is like and then you, you know other people are like no we won't associate with you it's like it, what are we even fighting for yeah, I always loved, uh, Russia actually used to have a law, it's not the case anymore, but um, they their law used to be you could not serve in the military if you were gay, unless it was a time of war. And I think that's beautiful, because that is, <laughs> that's us saying, hey, fuck you, but if we decide fuck these other people more than fuck you, then it's no longer fuck you. <laughs> we yeah. will together say fuck these other people. 
Yeah, um, they, they've actually defined the the late the levels. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here's who we like, and here's our high level mark of who we like, and here's our low level mark of who we like. Um, but but yeah, no. So when I first joined, I had to sign a waiver saying I would not engage in homosexual, bisexual, or trisexual activities. And I am an avid consumer of queer culture, just so that I can find out what the fuck a trisexual encounter is. That was going to be my next question. (laughs) I still to this day have no idea what that was. I am convinced that some like like 60 year old general was like writing this waiver out like some jag attorney in the military is like it's like oh, homosexual and bisexual what are they gonna come up with next let's just put trisexual on there just in case just in case they invent something we don't have to redo this yeah we'll let's cover all our bases and if, if right. something else comes out we'll just call it trisexual because it's already in there yeah it's like it's a uh, it's exponential it's like get instead of gay squared it's like gay cubed <laughs> But yeah, I had to sign that paper, um, and I think I hooked up with a guy like that night, so that didn't last long. Right on top of the paper, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, right. I, it just really got me. It just the oppression really like steamed my veggies, and I had to go find a guy like right away and opened up Grinder in the recruiting office. Yeah, I um, made fifty copies of that paper and laid it over the bed, and you're like, "It's ready. It's ready." It's funny. Uh, it's funny you mentioned copies. If we remember, let's circle back to that. I have a funny story about copies of something. But I signed that paperwork for like, and it was in effect for like maybe a year before Don't Ask, Don't Tell got repealed. And then I talked to my mom a lot um, about, you know, what my mom was a woman in the Navy when like that wasn't cool or, or was not common, I should say. And so like getting her perspective really kind of helped me realize that I needed to show competency like I needed people to know that like I was going to do the job just like they were going to do and that my orientation had nothing to do with it just like my mom back in the 80s showed that she's a professional who's doing her job and her gender had nothing to do with it so I came out pretty I came out in boot camp we me and my like all the guys in my boot camp company we were like using these super tiny like follicle scissors they gave us to like pull all of the loose threads out of our uniforms with it's just like a, a beautiful form of hazing. It took like hours. I remember I was like, these scissors are like my ex-boyfriend's dick. They are dull and curved and they are not getting the job done. And like my whole <laughs> unit I was with laughed really hard at that. And they all like accepted me like right away, minus like one or two goobers. But and from then on, I just really didn't, did not bite my tongue. And I kind of like fought fire with fire. Like I was in a lot of all entirely hetero male spaces and this may surprise you but those are horrific spaces to be in where (laughs) all of of conversation are had and so you know guys talking about like their conquests of women I would just like respond with my conquests of other guys (laughs) to like keep it very 50 50 I did my part to redress the balance at least yeah no I know because definitely dudes like to when they find out I'm gay they Sometimes, especially like at a bar when people are drinking, all of a sudden I'm like one of the guys and I'm like, I don't want, no, (laughs) number one, I don't want it. Number two, I, you guys can't get mad when like women get with other women. Like I don't, you make it so easy. Yeah. I really love, I think one of my favorite friendships in the world is a gay man, gay woman friendship, because it's like, we both are so opposite in exactly the same ways it's like we both (laughs) we've both taken a pledge to do the antithesis of what the other is doing and yet somehow that makes us so common and it's like this weird purely platonic ideal of like a mutual non-sexual interest that I think allows for like such a great blossoming friendship like I all of my lesbian friends I'm always just like I don't think I could have this connection with a straight woman and I would imagine you probably can't have as good a relationship with a straight guy as you can with a gay guy. No. Broadly speaking. And I do, yeah. Obviously. Included. Always. Yeah. No, I have a lot of great straight guy friends, but I also talk to a lot of straight guys that are trash. Yeah. And there's always, not always, but anytime there could be a potential for like a, you know, like I've had some straight male friends that like later on were, you know, or right away were just like, I thought we were just friends and then they 
did not think that like there's a potential on even if it's not on both ends of right. like some sort of you know sexual relation happening um and it's definitely like i think we're close and we're cool and they're like i've never talked to another woman like this before like is this what love is and it's like no no nope. this is, nope. <laughs> but, but i'm glad you're opening up and when you meet that yeah. lady that appreciates it she will appreciate this and she should thank me um <laughs> that kind of thing all right, tell your tell your copy story because I know we put a pin in it, and usually we don't come back to pins, but I remembered. Well, thank you because this is a good one. So, uh, when I was on the submarine, we had a uh, we were out to sea, and we had the squadron master chief writing on our submarine, and he was like, I did not know him personally, but he was super crusty old navy guy, joined probably before I was born, so had a reputation for being like pretty homophobic and so so he is staying in the chief's quarters on board the submarine that's like a kind of smaller part of like the residential spaces but it's like just for the chief petty officers so it's maybe like nine beds on board or i think it was 12 but that's honestly it's like 12 beds in a room the size of your office at work so like (laughs) it is tight but, so a small, um, small, small space. <laughs> right. And so chiefs love to play pranks on each other in the Navy. And so one of the chiefs came to me and was like, hey, <laughs> do you have any gay porn? And I was like, what? And he's like, like gay porn magazines. Do you have any of those? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, can I like get some of the old ones you don't use anymore? And I was like, uh, okay, sure like what's going on he's like it's better if you don't know and i was like okay and so they took these old gay porno hacks i had they tore out all the pages of dudes just like railing each other and like plastered this like homophobic dudes like whole bedroom cubby in that shit and he like basically like got into the bed and like turned the light on and it's just like <laughs> nothing but like cock just in everywhere his face. <laughs> right all over and he's just like completely freaked out and i mean what sucks is like you can never let people get a rise out of you in those environments. Like especially when you're like out to sea or you're on deployment. Like when people find out what bugs you, there's nothing to do. So all they're gonna do is bug you the entire time that way. And so yeah, they really got his goose on that one. And it was really funny seeing him after that because he knew it came from me, but like I'm not allowed to go in that space because I wasn't a chief. So he like knew it didn't come from me. Like he knew I was the source, but he knew like I didn't do it. And so it was really funny, like our tortured small talk, like, oh, ending on what we started on small talk, our tortured small (laughs) talk, uh, whenever I would run into him on the boat where he's just like, he's like, morning. (laughs) I'm like, hey, (laughs) good to see you. Yeah, it's like seen anything new lately. (laughs) Right. You got a lot of sausages on your plate for breakfast there, chief. (laughs) See, that must have been so, and that's good too, because like, they were like, hey, we need to have these magazines. We're not going to tell you what it's for. It's better that you don't know. Yeah. And, and it was something that you would have done, I feel. Oh, well, I, w- I would have been, like, super on board. I would have been like, here's some DVDs. Like, let's, <laughs> can, we, can we set up a monitor? Like, let's, yeah. let's so really go. Surround for it. sounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wait till he, like, takes all the magazines down, goes to sleep, and you're like, can we set this for an hour? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, just, like, periodically through the night, revisited with more <laughs> unsolicited gay porn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What a way to what a way to wrap it up on gay porn. <laughs> Thank you. I'm I'm proud of that. Yeah, I am too. We haven't done this yet. I, I enjoy it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it too. I thought for sure I was gonna sit here and talk to you a whole bunch about stand up, which I have done twice. <laughs> well, I've done storytelling twice, but like stand up, which I'm like newly trying to get into. And I was like, Oh, I can ask Amanda all these questions on the podcast. But like <laughs> I should have known I wasn't gonna completely reverse your format and become I become the interviewer and you become the interviewee. One what some sometimes people try to do that. They try to flip the script and I'm into it because, you know, I'm asking you a lot of questions and I'm asking you to be vulnerable. So it's only fair that that I do it too. But let's have you you should do some stand up and then we'll have you back on and in our second episode since we've got the history stuff. Yeah talked about you know the history of your life we've now discussed you know that we can get more to the the artistry and the formatting and all of my ridiculous opinions about everything about stand-up uh, that no one asked for but i'll still tell you anyway because that's who i am yeah just start hosting your shows earlier so that i'm not in bed by the time i'm supposed to be going <laughs> everyone says that but i'm like my shows are like at seven and eight and everyone's like too late i'm, I'm just- old 
I'm very old. You're not that old, I'm but um. Old. Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm going to San Francisco next week, and I have a show. My girlfriend's so happy. I have a show on Saturday at 2 p.m., and she's like, "That I'll go to that show. Yeah, that's that's what I need. I need, like, the day-drinking comic circuit. That's what I need to get plugged into. It's just so hard to, like, you know, especially if you, you know, I'm not a super dirty comic, but sometimes it's so hard to tell jokes when it's, like, still daylight, you know? Yeah. Is that an right. acceptable use of the word pussy at 2 p.m.? Yeah, I don't want to talk about putting up posters of gay dudes' hogs inside a guy's bedroom while the sun is still shining upon my face. Yeah, and people are wheeling kids in strollers by the bus. Like, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, so you're like, it has to get dark, and then it's like, and then I can feel free. <laughs> but yeah, I'll work on it. Next time I do a 2 p.m. show in New Orleans, I'll, I'll definitely let you know so you can come on out and, and try some stand-up. I'll be there. But yeah, thanks for, thanks for doing the podcast. Um, if... If you want to, and no pressure, if you want to let people know where they can find you on social media, if they uh, want to interact with you or, you know, replace your gay porn or whatever they want to do, if uh, you want to share your Insta or any way that people can connect with you. Yeah, anyone can follow me on Instagram. I don't have Twitter because I hate You're not it. that old. <laughs> no, no, I just hate it. Um, I, uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm at dill underscore pickle. D Y L underscore P K L. So. All right. And we'll put it in our, our liner notes too, so that people can, you know, they don't have to get out a pen and write it down now. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dylan. This was a lot of fun. See, I learned a lot about you. Yeah. This, uh, this is the most we've learned about each other since we worked together. <laughs> <laughs> since I learned you had a mustache. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. See ya. Thank you to Dylan Perry for sharing his world with us. Special thank you to Ryan Golub for our theme music. Social media with us. You can find us on Twitter at Queer to My Heart or on Instagram and Facebook at Near and Queer to My Heart. If you're old school, email us near and queer to my heart at gmail.com. We love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Mm-hmm.